everyone to the big fat recruitment debate takeover. Um, it's thank you, Confex, for, for hosting this event for us. This is an event that we've been running since the end of uh, last year, really, and it's our third session. So we call it round three as we're in the boxing ring. Uh, and the reason for that is because actually uh, we're all competitors here today. So uh, friendly competitors. Um, so hence the boxing ring, hence the fight. And hopefully we're going to bring you lots of different varied opinions. Um, you never know what's going to happen in these sessions. So. Um, as I mentioned, we this is our third session and this event was created because we felt there was really a need for a different type of learning event, a different type of webinar. We wanted to move away from that really kind of stuffy, uh, pre-recorded type event where you just kind of sit there and be spoke at. So we wanted to create something with a little bit more energy, um, something really honest and raw. So we normally hold this event at a nine o'clock in the evening session. So everyone has got the kids to bed. So we can just relax. Um, there is normally alcohol involved and, a, and um, some fruitful words. Um, so we'll keep it as clean as possible today but it's it's really just a chance for people to talk openly and honestly and we wanted to make it as interactive as possible um so before i introduce you to the the panelists um just wanted to let you know for you guys again it's it's very informal um and you know we do encourage you to ask as many questions as possible throughout the event so you've got a q a um box there and what we'll do is we'll try and answer as many questions as we can um, normally we'd get you to come on and put your video on but today's session's a little bit different um so if you like what you see today and you want to ask more questions and get more involved we will be holding around four on the 17th of February at 9 p.m. probably but actually that will be a question we'll ask you a little bit later about the time. Now it'd be really great for us to know who we've got here today so it may be that you are a recruitment consultant yourself or you own your own re recruitment business you could be a hiring manager um, so or you could own your own business and 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 be literally responsible for all the recruitment or you might be looking for work at the moment um, now all four panelists we're all event recruitment specialists so there is a large emphasis around the events industry and each of us have worked in slightly different areas of events which we can go into as well um, so uh, what I'd like you to do for us, if you could, in the chat section, just tell us um, who, who you are today and who's here. So if you're a hiring manager, if you're um, somebody that's looking for work, um, a recruitment manager, it'd be great to know who we've got here. So um, this session is normally an hour and it normally overruns, but today we've only got 45 minutes. So I've done enough talking. Um, but just to let you know that I'm Natasha, I'm one of the co-founders at ExpoCast and I'm going to introduce you you all to our panelists now so I'm going to start with who I can see next which is Robert so Robert can you introduce yourself please tell us a little bit about you and, and your business thank you hello everyone uh, and again just saying what Tasha thank you Confex for uh, taking over so my name is Robert Kenwood um, I'm an events uh, specialist events recruiter I've been running my business for about five years I'm the chief talent officer at you search and select which is a specialist senior recruiter I'm also the chief cheerleader at a new platform called The Hub, which is the world's only SAAS recruitment platform for our sector. Go check that out. Um, that's me. Two minutes. That was quick. <laughs> awesome. You kept Liz. going on, so I thought I'd better shut up a bit. <laughs> Lils. Hi, I'm Lils. Uh, I'm the director of Albany Appointments. Um, we specialise in B2B conference and events recruitment. Um, so we work with mostly in-house commercial conference companies, publishers, membership organisations um, and some exhibition companies. So, yeah, we recruit for a wide range of positions from uh, conference production, events management, sales, marketing, graphic design, from junior grad all the way up to senior management. Um, I think that's me in a nutshell. Thanks, Lils. And Mike? Hi, everyone. So I'm Mike. I am the other co-founder of ExpoCast. Uh, so we are specialist recruiters for the global exhibition industry. Um, so, yeah, we, we work across the world, recruiting anywhere from uh, entry-level roles up to uh, director level and CEO. 
Awesome, thank you. So I can see in the chat actually that I think everyone, well, most people that are here today are actually looking for roles. And um, there's been a few comments of, isn't isn't the whole indus events industry looking for roles? I mean, I know it does feel like that, and we're in a very very difficult place right now um but you know today is really we can we can talk about that we can let off some steam we can be really raw so uh, what i'm going to do is start off with the questions um and i'm just going to throw it out there really so guys what does 2021 hold for you you know are 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 you working on roles at the moment you know what's things how do you feel going into the new year um we weren't allowed to swear yeah <laughs> <laughs> Robert, you can kick off for that. <laughs> uh, so I think we're all aware that realistically, you know, the, the industry isn't coming back till the end of the year in, in sort of how we want it, as in the live element. So for recruitment, obviously, we're starting to see, sorry, me, you know, starting to see the, the first glimmers of this sort of February, March to August. That's going to be the, we all talked about this offline earlier, that's going to be the biggest, most incredible gold rush wild west recruitment you'll ever see as everybody needs to scale back up to get to where we are so yeah i'm starting to see as you know i work on sort of senior roles i'm starting to have a couple now got a couple of freelancers gone out but really i think it will be that sort of february march when we all start you know seeing everything we want i'm looking for a, a client services manager down here in brighton i'm looking for a business development director in London. I'm looking for an art director and a client services director in February. Were you uh, just looking around your own room for those, by the way? No, I'm, I'm old school, man. I've got a whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a whiteboard. And was like, <laughs> I'm looking for a business development <laughs> director. Open up the clothes drawer. <laughs> that would be weird. That's <laughs> candidate satisfaction too far, isn't it? I've got them locked in my room. <laughs> Uh, that's exclusivity that is right there that is exclusivity so yeah you know we're, we're starting to see you know there's there's no way anybody's like missing out on anything at the moment you know we're still very much at the beginning of coming out of this so uh, yeah we're starting to see the light shall we say that's good that's really really good to hear um what about yourself Lils? yeah i mean to be honest i'm, I'm feeling really optimistic about this year um it's certainly i'm you know i I'm really thinking it's going to be better than last year quite considerably. Um, already in the last, I pretty much since the news of the vaccine came out, you know, I don't know if that's, you know, I'm sure it's got something to do with it as well, but we've really seen lots of green shoots appearing in the industry now. So, um, yeah, we've got quite a few positions on at the moment. Um, so um, from event executive roles um, to conference producer roles to uh, head of content as well. Um yeah, and a, a sales position. So quite a range of positions, which is really That's nice. Great. That's really Finally great. Finally feel, yeah, just coming back to work in January and actually being mm. busy, which was a really lovely yeah. feeling mm. after such a quiet few months. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I just uh, sort of mention for the audience, you know, if they hear it, these roles that we're kind of discussing now, if, if anybody wants to apply for these positions, um, where's the best place for them to go and to find the information on these roles? head to our website everything's okay. advertised on there so okay and yourself robert uh i will put the website link in the comments for everybody but yes on the website oh that's brilliant robert I is think... that the hub <laughs> no the hub is a uh, automated recruitment platform which is oh. the future of recruitment which will go live in april so everyone get on there and put your cv on there but thank you <laughs> that's fantastic i know that we uh, do a lot of advertising through linkedin so anybody who's on the uh, event today um we're all on linkedin we're heavy users of social media and we advertise all of our jobs on linkedin i know that Lils and robert do the same so um do find us on linkedin guys uh, and connect with us and if we're not able to answer any questions feel free to throw some at us um personally as well so sorry over to you mike thanks yeah so um couple of well i've got a couple on at the moment so have you um i'll let you talk about your ones um as i said uh, in the intro obviously we're um we're, we're we cover cover the global exhibition industry so mine are i've got one in one in dubai that's a commercial director another one in bangkok which is a project director in terms of um green shoots uh you know definitely this is even though it's only two roles it's certainly the busiest i've been in about eight and nine months which is great um, and you know, it's as Robert kind of alluded to. It's um, I, I think you know, it's all linked to, to market confidence, isn't it? Um, certainly for us covering exhibitions, we're kind of 
we're closely tied into how well the travel industry is doing as well. So, you know, a lot of our business development has been focusing on countries in which they're, they're allowed to run exhibitions, but actually talking to most of those organisers, there's no point in them booking their shows in until they know that most of their exhibitors and visitors can actually get there. And, and that means international travel. So we're, we're keeping a close eye on that. But I do think, you know, all the rapid testing developments, all of the vaccines being rolled out, it's only going to get more and more positive, I think. Um, obviously, here in the UK, we've kind of been set back a little bit in terms of the time frame of, of stuff returning just due to this new strain. But that's not going to slow down the vaccine rollout. Um, so we'll, I, you know, I'm quite confident we'll see a gradual increase throughout the year in, in terms of, of things picking up. And I, I'm, I'm, my, my cautious optimism is sort of some point in the second half of the year, recruitment levels will be at pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic levels. Um, and obviously, yeah, like Robert said, you know, the, the recruitment's got to return at a faster pace than the events themselves. Otherwise, there's not going to be anybody to actually sell them and run them. I think we, we talked about this before, didn't we, that realistically we all knew this sort of midway through last year that we weren't going to be working on any recruitment roles because until, until, uh, you know, unless we're really lucky, but until a vaccine comes in properly, you know, our event industry, whether you like it or not, is not going to get back to the levels that we want. And I think we talked about last year, they worked out, we were running, I think it was one to 5% capacity. You know, this 80 billion, hundred billion industry is running at one. And that's like the odd virtual event, obviously. Um, I think this year with a good wind, we should get back to like 30 or 40%. I, I possibly think about 30. Now that doesn't sound a lot, 30%. But if any other year we said our industry is going to grow by 25%, we would all be skipping down the street, you know? And so I think, you know, we're all, well, I know very much I'm a realist. I'm also positive, by the way, Lils. Um, <laughs> but I'm also, I'm not one of these, you know, oh, it's all sunshine and lollipops. Everything's wonderful. Because it's not. We've still got another three months of, in and out of a lockdown. Um, I think it's important for us, Robert, to stress that to everyone as well, because yeah. sometimes it's really frustrating when you hear people saying, oh, yeah, well, we're really positive, really optimistic, and blah, blah, blah. And people are sitting at home going, well, great, that's not helping me. I can't get a job. And yeah. so I think, I think, you know, we don't want to, you know, we what we're saying is that we've seen some green shoots, things are moving, they're moving in the right direction. But let's not let's not pretend yeah. that it isn't we're still in a difficult place because we are we are in a really tough place um i know that some of my roles that i've had on recently i'm working on a project manager role um for a, a, an exhibition design company i've got some digital marketing roles coming on and we've got a lot of hybrid uh, event production roles coming in as well so uh, that's something that we predicted um that you would get these cut this this demand for people with that virtual event experience so that yeah. is definitely coming up um and i know between the four of us we've got loads of connections um and contacts um you know who we can who we can um, refer you to if you're looking to upskill in terms of that that virtual event experience as well um but you know although the green shoots are showing and we've got these roles um just because we kind of we've got the roles doesn't mean that the the start dates are, are next week or even next mm. month you know we're looking at events and we're going okay well events aren't back yet so if the events are going ahead in July August that's probably going to postpone those start dates to March April so again it's just being realistic as to you know start dates as well I know you mentioned yeah. that Robert so we have to be we have to be pragmatic and realise we're an industry that depends on global travel and large gatherings of people. This virus, <laughs> without swearing, um, you know, we are literally in the worst sector you can be in for this virus. And we have to get that. And I know it it's could really be hard. worse. It could be aviation. Well, yeah, I, someone I, <laughs> it might have been one of you that said that about you either travel or you don't, at least with events, yeah. or go online sort of thing. And I thought that was such a good thing. Yeah, you could be a venue. I, I did some filming for the MIA the other week at the Belfry. So I stayed at the Belfry and literally, you know that how amazing the Belfry is? I think there must have been five people staying in the Belfry. Wow. And it was, I'm walking in, I got a, a suite for like 55 quid. So there was some good stuff. I had like a five bedroom suite. I was on the phone to my wife like, woohoo, I had a bath at 11 o'clock at night. Um, <laughs> but I was talking to the reception and they're just like, there's just nobody. There's nobody yeah. around. We can't do anything. You know, you feel, it's just, you know, it breaks your heart. But at least we have a, we know that we are coming out of this that's the thing yeah. i think 
we've all got yeah. to take on board. There's light at the end of the tunnel, whereas when yeah. we first went into that first lockdown, it was, it was just that that feeling of, you know, having no hope, you know, everything was just so hopeless. Um, and we're not in that place at the moment. So at least we've kind of evolved with each lockdown. I think the mm. first lockdown was still this kind of very naive sense of, don't worry, by October, we'll be back to normal. And then mm. the second lockdown before the vaccine was announced, it was, when is this going to end? This is mm. hell. And now the third lockdown, it's like, okay, well, the vaccines are being physically rolled out. So we should, you know, I think this is probably the most, we can actually be the most realistic in terms of having an idea about end date and when we are going to start returning. Yeah, but, okay. you know, absolutely. Definitely for people to stay up. patient because it's so, it is still tough out there and there are green shoots, but just keep, stay positive, stay patient because, you know, don't expect it to just, you know, it's it's going to be a very slow healer this for, for almost every business as well so yeah absolutely I think that probably leads us in quite nicely um to our Q&A because um, really that's what these sessions are all about it's about you guys what you need from us um and I think it's it's important to stress that uh, one size does not fit all and sometimes you can get some advice from one recruiter what are you laughing at Robert I knew you were going to smirk at that comment I knew I'm you were really worried that people in like there's like 89 people here and, I, and I'm worried, they're like, who are these four idiots, especially that one? Because normally our, our whole thing about the debate is that it's just the four of us going, hey, this is what's going on. And I feel a bit like, oh, my God, it's complex. We need to be able to. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, we are... <sighs> we're all going to offer a different opinion and I think I think that's great because there are so many different you know we all like to receive uh, CVs in different ways we all like different types of formatted CVs we you know we do things differently so it's not they're not wrong or right answers but hopefully today what we want to do is give you our different opinions on things so you can choose what's best for you because there isn't there isn't one rule for writing a CV it you know there's so many factors so um, I'm just going to go in with the questions so we can really help people now with our answers um i'm going to go in with a question that i've received recently um and i think it's i think it's quite a good one um pdf cvs versus word cvs word documents now i know i know what's what's happening is that i think people are concerned that when they apply for roles and they upload a pdf version of their cv they aren't there is this worry that you know whether the ats systems or the automated um systems that they're being uploaded to are actually able to decipher and read what's on the cvs and people are worried that they're getting rejected and their cvs aren't actually being looked at so the question is you know should they send in a word document but of course word documents don't look half as you know bold and as bright as the as as pdf so um i'm just gonna um, throw it at you robert what's what's your thoughts and ideas between the pdf and the word um cv format in this earth shattering question that's on on the tips of everybody's tongue i bet it's not <laughs> I can't believe it's taken us to round three to cover this. Honestly. I know. I mean, this is like <laughs> number one. What, sorry. Uh, ATS systems, automatic tracking software. If somebody says upload your um, CV via this portal, maybe the hub or something like that, like the hub.jobs or something like that, um, then generally put a PDF. My software actually will take both, just as an aside. Uh, but yeah, if you're asked to upload it, just put it in, you know, uh, it's probably as a Word document because it can scan it easier. And most of these job boards have cheap software and, they, you know, that will get in there. If you're sending it to a, an email address, to a recruiter, especially, send it as a PDF because then they can't muck about with it, unfortunately, which they will. Um, because we all copy and paste your details onto a letter-headed CV anyway. That's part of, obviously, our submissions and we've all got different ways of doing that. Um, but by sending it as a PDF, it's just it's just easier. It's just easier. And it won't change on formatted if it's opened on somebody else's laptop and it just stays the same. Yes, yeah, not everyone's got Word, have they? So, you know, um, for example, you know, we, we as a business use use G Suite. Um, you so got we, Word? I have. I, I actually have, Natasha doesn't. But then you've only got a brand new laptop. So. Just, you, just, just pay, the, got word. pay the five, pay the five oh, 99 probably. a month and get get microsoft office anyway anyway my point is that not every recruit is going to have word so and also i think with the pdfs in terms of the ats stuff as long as you've exported it directly, Sorry, you haven't got word <laughs> bloody hell natasha. we're really starting at the basics here come on open up the person, natasha let him have word for god my, if somebody Sorry, sends me a word here. document 
my G Suite can show me a preview of it, and it just trans it just um, translates it, it into the G Suite it. version. It's fine. Let me just just, get just that. to clarify to Mark Felstead, I've got word. It's Natasha who doesn't. Let, let me just thank get you that cool. Concern. Yeah. Sure. We could have a little fundraiser for Natasha. It's only five ninety nine a month. <laughs> That, yeah, that phone great. call is the 1960s calling Natasha. It wants to know, can it have a word? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, we should do it like, all we are saying is give Natasha a word. <laughs> Look, tough times, all right? Tough times. Beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so what, like a PDF is like there's there's so many different formats. Obviously, you can do you, it could be something really snazzy you put together on somewhere like Canva, in which case, I don't know. I, I think depending on the, the sophistication of the ATS, like Robert said, you know, some of them will still probably be able to pull all of the data out that it needs to in order to be able to to kind of match you up. Um, whereas if you've literally written your CV in Word and then exported it into a PDF. I wouldn't have any concerns about putting that through through um, through an ATS. I think that that would pick all of the um, all of the details up just as well as the Word document itself. I, I think that's a good point. If you've yeah, if, if it's created almost like an image and you've kind of added text to an image, that's where you're going to have issues. I mean, yeah, I think formatting issues do come up if it's on Word and you're opening it on different computers. But yeah, I use a you know with my database, we you know it passes all the details from. The CV, so it imports their telephone number, their email address, their skills, so it flags everything up. So sometimes with PDFs, it doesn't always do that, and yeah, so I would definitely advise. But usually, I mean, I quite often ask for a plain Word document anyway because we attach. I think most recruiters do this. We attach our own notes on the same document on top of an original CV as well. So when they've got a PDF, it's just quite fiddly because then you've got to convert it and go back and yeah. forth. So. Usually, I think if you are working with a recruiter, do send them just a plain word document as well. So have both is the uh, is have the both, general. Yeah. <laughs> carry yeah. Natasha uses, yeah. <laughs> right, moving on. Uh, far as away from word as possible. Um, <laughs> one of the most popular questions here is: with lots of people applying for the same job, what makes a CV stand out? Who would like to go first with that? We could even discuss pet hates and pet loves with this one. Oh, we could. Yes, we could discuss because that was. Whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want, Natasha. <laughs> um, can I go with this one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, absolute pet hate of mine on any CV is just well, just general sloppiness, spelling mistakes, and typos, and just people who've not taken the time to proofread it properly. Um, that and a Tinder style photo. Uh, mm. I think there's nothing that puts me off more than uh, a really dodgy kind of pout Tinder style picture. Well, the half movie. photos, you know, the ones oh. like that? Well, pretty much any oh, with the photo, hair, like, let's be honest. Over like the, the face. Half, the like... half like that. <laughs> Asha, you should talk. You're, um, you're <laughs> for our flyer. You're like that, huh? <laughs> That, that was a reason for that. I don't know yeah. why pictures aren't just. Oh. It's not on his it's CV. Not a CV. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, it's just it's just knowing what's appropriate and just you know kind of again just having a professional headshot. Um, so yeah, I think dodgy photos. Um, generally not a fan of any photos. No, no. If I'm honest, but yeah. if you do put a photo on, just keep it just you know just a very simple photo. Okay. Um, and good things on a CV. I actually talk a lot about UX on CV, so having a really mm -hmm. clean user experience. So just mm. not, don't make the recruiter think. So when you have to kind of work out, okay, when, what their dates and what have they done here? And you've got loads of information in one space, just something that's just very clean and easy to read. And just, a, you know, in terms of its actual, just think about the accessibility of information. That's yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's quite good to give your CV to a friend or family and say, read through that. Does it make sense? You've got, yeah. you've got to just think that, you know, this person knows nothing about you and it may, may make sense to you. The terminology that you use may make sense to you, but um, it could be completely different in a different business. So you, so yeah. get somebody else to proofread it to see if it makes sense to them. Cause if it doesn't, the likelihood is it might not make sense to the person you're sending or, it to. Or ask them what they're thinking about. Cause obviously they would, you know, mm. now you've read that, what three things would you say about me? Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. I mean, that's the thing you've just got to imagine anyone who reads your CV has got you know a matter of seconds if not just a couple of minutes to really read it on first impression how can you deliver the most amount of information in the shortest space possible yeah. and that's not about cramming the most amount of text in on one page or yeah. you know in, in all in one Absolutely. Page. Yeah. definitely take not a, five or six page CV either. 
to take a step back a, a bit from that question, obviously, you know, where, yes, adverts are attracting applications in the hundreds at the moment. And as for recruiters who are sifting through all of those applicants, I think we could probably all agree that the vast majority of them aren't necessarily even, even close to being right for those roles. Right. So I think actually, to, if, you're, if the question is about how do you make your CV stand out, I think you know, it's, it's a really important thing to go for quality over quantity in terms of the applications that you're going for. If you are more selective about the opportunities, opportunities that you're going for and you're more confident that you actually have a genuine shot at getting that job above a market full of candidates who are potentially applying for roles they're overqualified for, then if you just be a bit more selective and then you've got a bit more time to go through the application process, you can tailor your CV for each individual vacancy. And that way you can pull out all of the really tangible bits of information that that job advert is asking for. You know, like, like Lils was saying, make, make, those, make those pieces of information jump out at the reader of that CV. Because, you know, you, you were talking, Lils, about only having a few seconds. I think the average is about five to seven seconds before someone makes a decision as to whether or not to keep reading your CV. So you haven't got long, you know, yes, name at the top, contact details, please. And then yeah. just make it really easy to see that you're working at, you've worked at the right kinds of companies, you've held the right kinds of responsibilities. If you're a salesperson, what targets you've had, did you actually achieve them? If you're a marketer, what was the size of your campaign budget, mm. operations? You know, it's all of those really tangible bits of, bits of information, make sure that mm. they jump out so that someone is, you know, really, really wants to continue reading your CV, basically. And in fact, below, oh, sorry. No, it's fine. I was going to say, and for you know, for us in the events industry, you know, name drop the types of shows you've worked on, the size of shows, you know, and and elaborate. So, um, you know, if there've been exhibitions, you know, make sure in your CV that you're using the keywords and the search words that will come up for roles in exhibitions. So, think of the different terminology that might be used for for exhibitions. You've got expo, exhibitions, trade shows. So, make sure that um, you know, if you're if you are applying or, or uploading your CV to a, a job search site that you've got those right keywords in your CV that are going to come through but definitely listing the types of shows um, you know and if you've got some really great brands that you've worked for maybe you've worked for the BBC or you know you know you want to you want to drop these names in because they're the buzzwords that recruiters are going to be skimming your CV and they're going to be jumping out at you um, so just make sure you've got those in as well. And just to add to that as well if you haven't worked for sort of larger household names then just a, a, literally one sentence below your job title and company of just describing what what that company or what you specialize in, B2B yeah. events marketer for, you know, X publishing company. You know, just if, again, it's just kind of making it obvious that you are a clear match for that role. So just a mm. very short description of each company. It's, just if you've worked for a small that, business or startup. Yeah, like, and, and the next layer up from that is, you know, as recruiters, part of our job is to ask the candidates there's many of the questions that the client is going to ask before the client has to ask them. We're trying to answer those questions before they need to ask it. So take that a level back. You as the candidate, you can be answering the questions before we even have to ask you those questions. Then that just makes it that much more efficient for us. I think it's, to be honest, though, it's an urban myth, isn't it? I, we all ask all the time, what are hiring managers? And, so hiring managers, for people that don't know, they're usually internal people, you know, looking for people. But hiring managers and recruiters are no different to anybody else. A hiring manager and a recruiter is paid to, you know, find people for a role. That's it. They're not going to give you the job. They're going to find you. That is their job. So you're not going to stand out to them. Unless, you know, you can stand down to them if you can. I, you know, like everyone thinks you should do three pages, four pages. I've seen people doing their font size, like eight and nine. And you're like, that's really mm. annoying. I can't read that. But to stand out for someone, you have to tell that person what you're good at, how you can add value and how you can make that employer's life easy. That is it. People, people write their job description from their previous role. No one's interested. Trust me, a potential employer doesn't care what you did for them, what they're interested in is the stuff that you were responsible for, how is that going to help them? And I think that's one of the things that people don't think is your CV gets you the interview and the interview gets you your job. They're two separate things. Stop thinking yeah. about your CV as getting you the job. And with a CV, all you've got to think about, and you sort of might you alluded to it, is what do you want them to say about you? That is it. That is my answer when everyone goes, oh, what's the secret? Because look, recruiters and hiring managers are basically human keyword searchers. 
they're actually even less intelligent than AI software, let's be honest, because AI software is amazing. You know, that is what they're looking for. They're told to look for XYZ experience, XYZ, and they'll just look for that and then create a shortlist and then obviously go into it and do orientation and stuff. So on your CV or your application or whatever, stop focusing on listing everything you've done and focus on putting stuff that that person can tell a story. So if I was, if Lils was my boss and I'm doing a shortlist to Lils, Lils, no matter how much paperwork I give her, no matter how much work I do, she is still going to say to me, right, talk me through these five applicants. I, I could give her video interviews, CVs, uh, behavioral profiles, psychometric. I could give her everything. She will still say to me, talk me through why you put these people forward. So what do you want me to say? That is what you've got to think. That is it. All the other stuff is fluff. One page, two page, font. It's fluff. It's absolute yeah. fluff. And it's it just, it's not important. It's important that... If you can't get your CV down to about 800 to 1200 words, it's not a CV application. And you can remember, send the second CV. If you get interview with, say, Mike, yeah. and Mike's your heart, there's nothing wrong with you saying, hey, Mike, I'm interviewing with you Wednesday. Here's a more detailed version of my CD. And that CV could be 20 pages long. Who cares? Yeah. I actually received a fantastic application yesterday. So there's a, um, and a candidate who works in events and they sent me over their CV. I think it was uh, two pages, uh, very, very clean, very crisp, um, the key details on there. And then they sent me an additional, um, uh, it was almost like a PowerPoint presentation um, of a little pictures of uh, all the events they'd worked on and what what their role was on that event. That to me was far more useful than a CV. It was visual. I understood that she had suddenly done exhibitions. They'd done weddings. They'd done all these different types of events. And I thought a little portfolio. Um, and it was really professionally done. It wasn't just random pictures. It was really if well they told done. Told you what they did, otherwise they yeah it, yeah they didn't even need to say what they Google did. Google sales they conference, and you go oh Google sales conference. But all I actually did was hand out bags. Yeah. But it was great. And I just think, again, that's thinking outside the box. That, yeah. it, that to me, is standing out because straight away, without even speaking to this candidate, I've got a really good idea of what they do and the types mm. of events they work on. Um, I'm going to move on from CVs. We've got because, seven minutes left. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm going to move on from CVs because we could have a whole session about to do CVs. hates and loves or did not? Or did you ask that? Or did Lil's? Lil's have done pet hates and pet, pet, pet loves. <laughs> pet loves. Um, but there is a few questions here that are very, very similar. And I just I think we should address them because I think it would help a lot of people. But um, it's about upskilling. What can people be doing in the meantime while, whilst they're looking for work to keep their skills fresh? Is there anything specific? Are there any free training that we can advise people to do? Um, I mentioned the Virtual Events Institute earlier. Uh, we can actually offer I think that's not free. But if you use um, ExpoCast as the um, as a code you get i think is it 10 percent off or 20 percent off 10 yeah, percent off um, all the training courses mm -hmm. there as well so that's the virtual side of things and um, but has anybody else um got any free tips or are you running any sessions yourself guys that could help individuals speak to, your, speak to your local chamber of commerce because they've all been given money to help people you know businesses or people looking for work so they're, they're holding lots and lots of your local council uh, local chamber of commerce will have stuff that's officially done um, what do you think, mean by that, Robert? What, what, what? So people should just contact them and say, "What I'm looking for work." What? Go on your local, like Brighton Chamber of Commerce. I did a, I think I did it five years ago. I did a social media in a day event, and it was nine till five. I think it cost me like eighty pounds, and and I learned more in that day than I think I've learned in ever since. But what happens is your local governments have a lot of stuff that you know they they're there to help, mm. but nobody really goes to them. The Chamber right. of Commerce is amazing. I think if you go on LinkedIn and just put hashtag event profs, you will see webinars Tons. all around the place. Tons, yeah. Um, but also, you know, I think a lot of this is a lot of smoke and mirrors because if you look at a lot of what the roles are, the, work, the role producer seems to be thrown around at the moment, whereas really a producer is what we would call an event planner or an event manager because no. it's all uh, Yeah. No, no, but no, it shouldn't be. But what I mean yeah. is they're calling it a producer because th that horrible phrase broadcast is now the new virtual. Everyone's saying, oh, it's broadcast content. So people use the word producer. But when you look at 99% of these job descriptions for producers, you're like, well, that's exactly the same as an event manager would do. I don't, mm -hmm. but that's, that's just terminology. So I think job titles are not as important as what they're going to ask you to do. And what they're going to ask you to do is, I think budgeting for a start is going to be the hardest thing. How the hell do you budget a multi-location hybrid event you know, with an online and offline audience, how do you show call something like that? 
How do you sort the logistics, the resource, that stuff that go speak to your associations. I'm part of ILEA. They're doing free stuff. The MIA, the NPI. Yeah, the associations are great. They're always running really good yeah. events. Um, and yeah. Prince 2. Apparently everyone is now Prince 2 qualified. I see that all over the place. Any other suggestions, guys? And then I'd like to move on to another question, if that's all right. The, the, the question was any free courses. And honestly, I, I haven't seen free courses. I mean, there's, there's various different platforms. I know that um, Expo Platform, they, they launched Expo Platform Academy. I think they're trying to populate that with various different courses covering different things. Mm. Um, someone in the comments, I think, has mentioned Event Academy. Yeah. Um, there's Bloom Training. There's, there's lots of providers out there, but I don't know of any that are doing stuff for free. Quite, uh, I mean, Virtual Events Institute, I know that they've got um, an open to work package. So you can get their courses much, yeah. much cheaper. Um, yeah. Do, and we I would like... To do my hate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're so desperate. I'm desperate. <laughs> my hate is virtual events being heralded as the future of our industry because they are not the future of our industry. Hybrid events are the future on a offline, live, you know, percentage, project by project basis. Virtual will probably take over a lot of meetings, but virtual events are not the future. I read this stuff a lot. And you've got, you've got all these people sat at home going, oh, my God, I'm never going to have a job again. People have got to be careful talking about virtual events. They are going to get us through this. They will have their place, but they are not the future of our I ATP. think that's the general consensus from our clients as well. And yeah. it, we just want to share that with you is yeah. that, um, you know, our clients are very much on board with, um, you know, there is certainly a place for virtual events. Um, and I think we don't want to come out of this, you know, and not learn that they are, they need and should be part of events. Um, there will maybe be a bit of a dip with virtual when live events come back because everyone will be desperate to see each other. But then it should balance itself out. And, you know, there, there, there will be a place for virtual events. It's, um, it's perhaps, rather than, perhaps rather than hybrid events being the future, I think maybe hybrid communities because there's, there's a big piece about whether or not, you know, how can you deliver the same level of customer experience to a virtual attendee and a physical attendee at the same event? So actually, you know, a lot, a lot of these um, event organisers, will they're, they're more likely to, to end up with a hybrid community where, you know, yeah. when virtual online stuff is, isn't done at the same time as the physical event. Um, I mean, we'll see a bit of both. There's going to be a mixture, but, yeah, you know, I don't I think, think... we've, we've learned this year about the kind of... online, won't it? It will be like 90% online and yeah. 10% hybrid, and then that will just go up and down depending on budget and projects and locations. And, stuff. and yeah. sector we have... as well, you know, there's, yeah. there's thousands this, of sectors out there. This year has definitely taught us how, you know, virtual events have been brilliant for pushing content out there and making things really accessible. But actually, you know, for a commercial event business, the reason why they put on these events is for sponsors to meet buyers and for networking opportunities. It's that interaction. They're not as commercially viable as a physical event. And that's where, you know, it's great for companies well, where they can push it. lots. Well, they can make, push, keep pushing content out all year round, which is great. It's a really good way of engaging with their audience year round. But actually, the physical events, they have to return because, you know, if you, from a financial commercial perspective, that's why, you know, there's no way that they can be replaced because you just simply can't make anywhere near as much money from a virtual I read, I read some physical. figures from a lot of the big, big agencies I talk to. They've sort of said our, our revenue is reduced by 60 percent, but our profit only by 30 percent. Mm. So, you know, it's it's still reduced by 30 percent. But, you know, there's much more money to be made against revenue on virtual because you're not yeah. subbing everything out. And that. It's all it's time. Just, but We're generating but leads as well. Spent on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. We're um, get cut off now. We are going to get cut off in a, in a moment. Um, I would. There's a there's a question here. Are we going to see lots of event profs going freelance this year? Um, and will companies be looking for freelance people as opposed to permanent staff? Would you recommend going freelance to anyone that's thinking about it? Um, I, I've heard this company. Yeah, I've heard this. I've heard this a lot. Um, I have heard this a lot. And I, I, I definitely at the end of last year, I, there was this thing of, you know, people were taking on contracts and, you know, freelancers because there was so much 
uncertainty and I guess it was safer for the employers to offer those freelance positions um, or contract roles um, I do for us I can only go by what we've experienced but we are actually getting permanent jobs come through now so that's great there's an uplift in those permanent opportunities um, but uh, personally I, I don't see any harm you know if you can freelance and it works for you, works for you and, and your family and what have you then um, I would I would be open I would be open to those suggestions and and certainly see what's out there if that's something that you you can manage yeah i think still the permanent market settles it makes sense to be open for fixed term contracts but there'll, there'll be a mixture it, it, you know from company to company it will depend on on their level of confidence if they're only willing to to risk paying someone on a project basis then that's what they'll do whereas if they've got the confidence to be able to hire someone full-time and invest in paying people like us for recruiting fees <laughs> And um, then they'll do it and they'll they'll rebuild their permanent teams. I think it's I just going to be more around pitching, isn't it? You know, it'll, it'll be more freelance. I think will be more around pitching for the next six months. Mm. You know, we've got a pitching. We need people, but we can't afford the fixed overhead. Come in for six weeks or two weeks because yeah. yeah. no one's going to recruit unless there's you know the, the the live element of it. So yeah, I mean, speak to accountants though and get limited because pretty much every agency because of. In personal indemnity and all the liability stuff they won't use freelancers unless they're limited it's a real pain in the ass about 95 percent of people will do that but right that's interesting yeah that's good to know i wouldn't want to give you that advice last year because if you went <laughs> you, would, you wouldn't be able to get furlough like i haven't been and i think we all haven't been able to get furlough Mm, absolutely I'm really conscious of time we've got sort of two minutes before we're cut off so just wanted to sort of end today with a thank you for joining us um sorry if we've not covered off your question today has dare I say it zoomed by oh. <laughs> sorry I had to put how, that how will it, 10 months is the first time I've heard I'm, that I'm literally amazed just too. Gonna, are you going to put your just me. giving page out Natasha Lale dot word just giving <laughs> <laughs> I'd like the whole 365 Microsoft thing package if that's all right. That would be great. Great well, outlook. <laughs> yeah. I know. But are we saying goodbye like bye? I do. I wave all the time. I bye. do as well. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It was brilliant. And um, yeah, looking yeah, forward to the next everyone. one. Thanks everyone for coming. Take care. And thanks, Convex, thank for you. having us.